introducing our very first speaker for today. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us how weaknesses in our health systems can have intense implications for health, economic progress, trust in governments, and social cohesion. Containing and mitigating the spread of disease and infection remains a massive priority. But so is strengthening the capacity of health systems to respond quickly and effectively to healthcare challenges so that our people can have better health outcomes. Dr. Farid Abdullah is our next speaker, and he will take an in-depth look at the impact of COVID-19 on our healthcare systems. Dr. Abdullah is a specialist in public health medicine and currently a director of the Office of AIDS and TB Research at the South African Medical Research Council. And since April 2020, he has been a member of the Steve Biko Academic Hospital Outbreak Response Team, working as a clinician in the COVID-19 wards and assisting with the provision of COVID-related equipment, staffing and infrastructure. He was also part of the COVID-19 vaccination team at the Steve Biko Academic Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Farid Abdullah. Yeah. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Anna and uh, Ahmed, for the invitation. And thank you for having, having me, Liana. Just go uh, through my slides quickly, a little more technical than everybody else. Uh, apologize for that in, in advance. But before I, I do anything, I just want um, to say um, how much uh, you know, it's, it's been a real uh, honor and a special privilege working with uh, a whole lot of doctors at Steve Biko Hospital during the COVID pandemic. Young doctors, uh, doctors who've been there for a long time, and who've just thrown their entire lives and careers at the pandemic. It uh, has been a pleasure working with them over these last two years, and uh, I think we're just so, uh, we can be so proud of the efforts that, uh, that, that has been done um, at the hospital. So um, I want to cover a few areas here. I'm very aware of the time, Salome, so I'll stick to it. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, just try to reflect on what's happened over the last two years and what might be some pathways to, to kind of go forward here. So uh, starting with the size and, and shape of COVID. <clears throat> well, I think what's really important is that, is that we know that this has been a, a ma major shock to the system of the world. But I, I just want to point out from this paper in the Lancet uh, a few weeks ago, that there's been a s serious underestimation of the number of deaths. And uh, we now um, have uh, well-documented estimates that there are probably between 17 and 19 million people globally who've died from, um, from COVID-19. You know, if you want to compare it to something, um, then there were about 50 million deaths in Spanish flu epidemic between 1918 and 1920. Um, uh, the HIV epidemic has had a, about 37 million deaths over a period of four decades. But, um, you know, this epidemic has been a, a major shock uh, to the system. Uh, this is a picture in South Africa. This, this is great data from the Medical Research Council. And um, you can see those blue lines across the four waves and the uh, officially reported uh, deaths and those are people who died in hospital. Um, it's just uh, approaching 100,000 deaths now, uh, as the president announced in his uh, talk last night. But at the MRC, we, uh, our, my colleagues documented what we call ex excess deaths. And uh, we think that the, the, the death toll from COVID-19 over the last two years is in the region of about 300,000. <clears throat> So, so these are hospital admissions as documented by the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. Uh, they've done a fantastic job to document uh, the hospital admissions across the public and the private sectors. And, and you can see that um, waves two and three were big waves and uh, wave four, the Omicron wave, uh, you know, started to see that decline. So we estimate about a half a million admissions 
you'll notice that the split between the public and the private sector is um, rather different from what you would expect, you know, because about 15% of the population is covered with medical insurance. You would have expected a lower, a lower rate of admissions in the private sector. So it's an interesting discussion point about why the private sector accounts for almost half of the admissions. And that could be a function of um, sort of a, a more forgiving eligibility criteria for admissions into the hospitals. Or it could be that um, the public sector didn't have uh, the number of beds that it needed to take on more people. Because you'll figure out from this that about two-thirds of the patients who died never made it into the hospital in, in this country. <coughs> Excuse me. So these data are from uh, Afrocentric. Thank you, uh, David uh, de Villiers, for this data. And it shows, shows the pic picture we've seen across public and private sectors. In the green line are the admissions um, in the private sector. And then you can see that there's been a significant decline uh, in 2020 and 2021. Um, this is a really important discussion point because we need to understand what went, to ha what happened there, and and basically, you can see um, in certain uh, hospital admission categories, um, you know, you can't really stop a, a cesarean section or a normal delivery. So those have kept pace with previous years. Um, the the trauma admissions went down, and that's. Uh, you know, partly due to the lockdown regulations. That was a big discussion over the last two years. But there's some things we don't fully understand, such as uh, asthma admissions, you know, why should it be fewer? Um, but it certainly, certainly has been. Um, a great concern has been admissions in cancer patients. Now, this is in the private sector, and uh, it's clearly going to be even worse in the public sector. So patients who had cancer were not coming to the hospital or because um, you know there was a, a shutdown of m many of the kind of non-COVID functions within the public and the private sectors, we see this fall off. And and I guess where I'm going is to understand what's going to happen over the next two years. Will there be a rebound, uh, or will it continue at this uh, lower uh, new uh, set level? Um, so these are data uh, from colleagues at Right to Care in the public sector district. Um, and you can see a similar picture. These are, are clinic visits. And you can see between a 15 to 25% decrease in head counts. So people stopped going to the clinics for multiple reasons. Sometimes the clinics were closed. Sometimes they were afraid to go to the clinic, uh, not to be infected. Uh, sometimes the staff at the clinic were down. So the numbers of patients they saw uh, were fewer. And I don't have the data for this, but we know from uh, all our colleagues in the private sector that GP visits uh, uh, went down significantly. I asked Adrian Gore uh, a, a question about this about, a, about eight, nine months ago, about whether this would be a new uh, level of GP visits uh, set for the private sector, or will there be a recovery? He thought there would be a recovery, but uh, I, I think that's something to, to think about. Um, this is the slide uh, that concerns me the most, working with tuberculosis. And what we saw in the first six months after COVID struck is a 50% decline in TB testing. And, um, you know, you test fewer people, you make fewer diagnoses, you treat fewer people. And actually, we've seen in the last uh, 12 months an increase in TB deaths recorded for South Africa. Uh, that's uh, the sort of epidemiological uh, effect of COVID on other disease patterns. Um, so um, basically, I've, I've, I have one overarching message here, and that is um, that COVID has like, knocked down inpatient and outpatient care in both the public sector and the private sector. And it's going to be uh, interesting to see over the next two years if there's going to be a rebound. It's also really important that we monitor the impact of that on mortality and morbidity. Um, 
So um, at the Steve Beaker Hospital, we've just put together a study to look at hospital admissions and death rates for in inpatients uh, in the two years before COVID, uh, during the two years of COVID. And what we're really interested in seeing is what would happen uh, over the next two years. And our hypothesis is that there will be an increase in death from untreated HIV, untreated uh, tuberculosis, oncology, and a lot of uh, those patients who really needed care and surgery, um, you know, the quality of their care, their lives will, 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 will be worse over the next two years. Um, and I'll come back to this in, in the conclusion. So that's the first overarching point. The second, and I'm delving into territory that I'm not uh, really uh, an expert on, which is the financials. So a couple of slides on this. The first is that um, there was a, a big investment made by government uh, of around 37 million rand, uh, billion rand um, uh, in the public sector, most of that going to provinces and quite a bit of that going to vaccine procurement. Uh, that number came down substantially in 2021. 20, uh, and uh, uh, at the time of making these slides, there wasn't an allocation yet for 22, 23, but there has been an allocation at a lower level. But this is the investment that government made in direct health care. Um, and uh, Ahmed, you'll be interested to see this uh, slide. Um, a lot of other people came to the, to the party here. It's not so well documented, but uh, apart from the Solidarity Fund, which uh, I have had a lot to do with over the last two years, um, great group of people um, making a, a significant investment, uh, quite a bit of that into healthcare. Uh, don't forget that Solidarity made the first payment for COVAX for our vaccines. So critical strategic investments but rather lesser known are the big donors to South Africa, the Global Fund, PEPFAR, making significant investments. I know at Steve Biko, we got a donation of high flow devices. We got a donation of 10 uh, LTE 200 ventilators, which we used all the time. Um, and um, I'm not sure about the medical schemes number, but uh, according to Dr. Sipo Kabane, in 2020 medical schemes spent about 24 billion rand so um, a lot of money was invested in the COVID health response, the direct health response. Um, but let's just drill down a little bit here, uh, because on the one hand, uh, whilst there has been uh, unplanned, unpredictable expenditure in the medical scheme sector, in the private sector, if you want, um, there has been some offset uh, by the reduction in admissions. Uh, so interesting offset here. Uh, the net effect of which is actually uh, quite a windfall uh, for, the, for the medical schemes. Um, you know, uh, uh, the 2021 data are not there. But speaking as a doctor about money, you know, I'd be really interested to know uh, uh, what, what the private sector is going to do with this uh, windfall, with these surpluses. Uh, and not only how they're going to share it with everybody else, that's not where I'm going, but how uh, it's going to impact on uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, trends uh, and, and what the private sector is going to do with this windfall over time. I'm sure you'll talk a lot about that and I won't venture any further here. Um, the opposite has happened in the public sector. These are data. I, I serve on this presidential health com uh, committee, uh, Ahmed, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna. Um, and actually... We have a completely different set of financials here. Basically, whilst there has been an investment in the health services uh, to pay for COVID, um, everybody, including the health sector in the, in, the, in the public service, had to contribute to that huge 500 billion special adjustment budget that Tito Mboweni announced uh, in and around uh, August of 2020. Uh, so health had to contribute to that. And the net effect is, is that um, uh, the impact on the provincial budgets is quite substantial. It's a 76 billion rand reduction. I would go as far as saying that the, the, the cuts to provincial health departments over, the next, over this year and the next two years is larger than any cuts we've seen since 1994. Um, and that puts the provincial balance sheets under significant uh, pressure. 
Um, so really, quite an important point. You can see a completely opposite reaction, uh, sorry, uh, opposite effect of the impact of COVID on the financials in the private sector versus the public sector. Um, so what, what really are the implications of that? And uh, these might not materialize because we're looking into the future, but we potentially have a situation here where there are budget cuts to the provincial health departments at the same time that we expect a rebound in utilization. You know, that's got to lead to uh, contradiction. Uh, the second point is that COVID's not gone yet. And even in our fourth wave, we, we still had quite a few deaths. We'll have a fifth wave and a sixth wave. And like everybody else, you know, I'm of the view that the, the deaths will decrease with each wave, that we, we have COVID under control. Um, but there will be a fifth and a sixth wave, and there will be a cost in lives and in, in RANDs. Um, and um, that puts the public sector under tremendous pressure. Wage negotiations are subjects I shouldn't go near, but um, you know the public sector has not budgeted for what might be a, a higher than expected wage increase. Salaries put a, put a lot of pressure on the public sector budgets, so that's something to think about. And then um, governments like the Gauteng Health Department owe a lot of money from previous years, what we call accruals. Uh, and between the accruals and the budget cuts, uh, you know, the, the, the provincial balance sheets have been significantly weakened by, uh, by COVID-19. And then, you know, COVID uh, vaccinations are likely to become an annual expenditure. So, um, so that's going to put more pressure on the public sector financing. So let me move on a little bit. Am I doing for time? I think I'm still okay. Um, on the left is the place I've spent a lot of my time in the last two years. That's the COVID high care ICU ward. It's a makeshift 37 bed ward uh, on the grounds of Shwane District Hospital run out of Steve Biko, staffed by Steve Biko. <clears throat> and um, on the right, are those uh, tents that almost every hospital in both the public sector and the private sector put up to screen patients uh, because this is the, the essential triage step in the care of hospitalized patients in this country and globally. So instead of going into the emergency unit, the patient is put in a tent or, or some facility at the emergency unit until they have a COVID test and the COVID positive patients get put in a COVID ward um, and the COVID negative patients get put into whichever ward they would have gone into anyway. This has been the singular most um, disruptive kind of uh, change in the basic care of hospital patients. And, um, and in a way, we're kind of stuck here because we still have COVID wards and we still have patients under investigation who need to be triaged. Um, but... Um, the profile of COVID has changed. Uh, this is a study which we did at Steve Biko and published it in December of um, last year, showing that patients in the hospital um, uh, here, most of the patients in the COVID wards now have what we call incidental COVID. That means that they are in the hospital not for the classical COVID pneumonia with respiratory distress, but they have a COVID positive test and a gunshot wound, or a COVID positive test and heart failure. But they have to be treated in a COVID ward. And, and we're kind of stuck now in these COVID wards with the majority of patients who are there with incidental COVID, and we uh, still have to treat them in isolation. And um, really the next thing to figure out for all of us in both the public sector and the private sector is um, you know, how to navigate our, our way to reintegrating COVID care into the normal services. Um, uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee just uh, last week has put together a team to look at this. Um, uh, because, but I want to conclude. So that's the first sort of change in the evolution of COVID. The second change in the evolution of COVID is this graph from Gauteng, which basically shows that we, we're having waves. But if you look at that fourth wave, that's the Omicron wave we didn't see a spike in deaths. It hasn't been exactly the same in all the other provinces, but Kaoteng is the best example of where most of the people are either uh, have immunity from prior infection or are vaccinated. 
And the net effect in a densely populated province like Gauteng is that you can have cases, uh, but the deaths stay down. And this is now the picture that's emerging in most parts of the world. And that's really the data set that's behind uh, the uh, loosening up of the economy, the restrictions, the speech of the president last night. And I'll show you the study that's actually there. Oh, before I go there, um, if you take a look, I couldn't resist keeping the slide in. Um, if you take a look in or around the beginning of February, there was a, a little uptick at the end. And, you know, we all kind of got quite concerned about this um, because we thought it might be a new variant. And in fact, it was a new subvariant. That's the BA.2 subvariant. Uh, but because of the large amount of background immunity uh, that we have in this country, uh, actually, the net effect was that it was just a little blip. So BA2 has taken over the whole of South Africa now. Almost 100% of infections in South Africa for COVID are with the stealth vari variant, or BA2 as we call it. Um, but the spikes we're seeing in Europe, the US, in a place like New Zealand, Hong Kong, are all this new variant. And uh, I wish I'd added one more slide, which is a comparison between what's going on in Hong Kong and New Zealand with this BA2 variant. In Hong Kong, uh, there's a lot of mistrust of the Chinese government by the population. And so the vaccination coverage levels are even lower than South Africa, in the region of 35 to 40 percent. And Omicron has caused a lot of death there. Uh, there are more deaths from Omicron than any previous wave, whereas New Zealand had 95 percent vaccination coverage and they've had this kind of picture with very little deaths. So it constantly reminds us that, as the president said last night, vaccination is the quintessential public health measure and we need to get it much higher up there. If we had, if we had um, uh, 80 or 90 percent uh, vaccination coverage, um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see this... Uh, don't want to waste time now. We wouldn't, we wouldn't see that fourth wave uh, of deaths, which is in the region of about 30,000 deaths for, for the fourth wave. Um, I'm coming to a close now. Um, so, so just to repeat that, in the COVID wards, we need to figure out a way now to uh, normalize how to manage COVID patients. And whether that's in a side room in a normal ward or to continue with COVID wards or to create a new category of wards for incidental COVID, those are, are complicated discussions that we have to figure out. And the second point about these tents, you know, we have almost no COVID now in Shwane, but all our patients still have to wait for 12 to 24 hours for a COVID test. If you're in heart failure, you don't want to be in a tent, you know, you want to be in an ICU. And, and uh, so we, we really are at this difficult stage in the health services where we have to figure out sort of our exit strategy here. Um, and, and what's driving that exit strategy gives us confidence is this sort of graph where the deaths are down, even though we might have a fifth wave or a sixth wave. Um, uh, so this is probably the most <laughs> important study of all done by Professor Shabir Mahdi, uh, you know, well in advance of all of this thinking. Uh, he set up the study months ago, and it basically shows he went from house to house uh, and sampled uh, everyone from the age of five up, upwards, and he showed that, that in South Africa we already have this high level of background immunity. He doesn't differentiate in this study between um, uh, prior infection giving immunity or vaccinations, but, you know, this is what every country in the world should be doing, and they're not doing it. Uh, public health decisions must be based on these kinds of data. Um, so I'll end on that point saying we're at this uh, interregnum now where we have to find a way back to normality. Uh, it's a little more complicated within the health sector than it might be in the economy. Um, and then I just want to thank a few people who uh, I talked to particularly uh, David de Villiers and uh, Nicola for those slides. Um, and uh, I hope I stayed within my time. Thank you very much, Leanne. Awesome. Dr. Abdullah, thank you very, very much for uh, that very insightful um, uh, presentation and just looking into some of the data and the graphs and all of that stuff. I've never been one for graphs, I really haven't, but suddenly when uh, COVID came, 
all I could look for were graphs. I mean, it's just insane how our, our, our minds changed. And these kind of things are so interesting to see exactly how it affected the healthcare system, those excess deaths, and that immunity, that herd immunity that, you know, South Africans, whether we're talking about the fact that that's vaccination or the fact that we've had COVID, we don't even know about it, is something that uh, that is very, very interesting. Now, remember, any question that you have got, post it into the chat and uh, we, I promise you, will get as many of these questions through because we're going to have a, an opportunity to speak to Dr. Farid when he joins us in a short while. Mm -hmm.